Hello everyone and welcome to Plain Talk. I'm your host AJ Rivera and today we are joined by Dr. Ryan Williamson. Uh, Dr. Williamson, thank you for sitting down with me. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so Dr. Williamson is an assistant professor here at Auburn University in our uh, political science department. Uh, Dr. Williamson, can you tell us a little bit more about your research and the classes that you teach? Yeah, so my interests are primarily in uh, voting behavior, political parties, election laws, Congress, pretty much everything you would need to know in order to understand election outcomes. Well, that's absolutely what we're going to be talking about today. As it is election season, we are just under five weeks away from November 3rd, which is Election Day. Um, and for Auburn residents and Lee County residents, the three big races that will be going on is obviously the presidential race, but also the two congressional races. We have a Senate race of Doug Jones versus Tommy Tuberville and a House of Representatives race between Mike Rogers and Dr. Adio Winfrey. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, in talking about all these races, they have an incumbent candidate. In general, can you tell us a little bit about what advantages the incumbent has? Of course, being an incumbent is typically uh, very valuable for a candidate. They, they have a record that they can run on as opposed to a challenger, which is generally campaigning on hypotheticals or what they would do instead of what they have done. Typically, incumbents enjoy uh, better name recognition as well, which can go a long way with voters who maybe aren't as tuned in as others. And then necessarily incumbents are proven winners um, because they, they had to win before they got there, which sends a strong signal to people that this is a candidate they can support. And so typically that helps them generate uh, more campaign support, namely money, which can facilitate them winning re-election. So starting with our first race in the House of Representatives, uh, for Auburn and Lee County, we are part of Alabama District 3. Our current representative is Mike Rogers, who is a Republican. He's been serving since 2003. His challenger is Democrat Dr. Adia Winfrey, who ran in 2018 for the House seat but lost in the primary. Um, based on your knowledge of polling and incumbency, where, uh, as I stated, Mike Rogers does have the incumbent advantages, uh, do you believe that he will be reelected? I, I do believe Mike Rogers will be reelected. As you pointed out, he's served the district for nearly two decades at this point. And even in 2018, which was typically viewed as a tough year for Republicans, he still won his, uh, his seat by nearly 40 percentage points. And so as long as he continues to do what he's always done, I suspect he, he should win reelection fairly easily. Well, let's move into the other half of Congress, the Senate. Here in Alabama, we have the Senate seat that is currently held by Democrat Doug Jones is being challenged by Tommy Tuberville. Now, Tuberville is a very common name here in Auburn as he served as Auburn's head football coach from 1999 to 2008. He's not a career politician, yet during the primaries, he was able to defeat the former Attorney General Jeff Sessions in a runoff election. Still, Senator Jones is the incumbent candidate. Uh, who do you think would have a better chance of winning in this scenario, the Democrat incumbent or the new Republican in a red state, yet he has little political experience? It, it's an interesting question. Um, Doug Jones is indeed the incumbent, but he's, he's fighting an uphill battle. The fundamentals of the state are strongly in Tuberville's favor. Uh, Doug Jones was able to win in 2017 primarily because of two factors. Uh, one of those was that he was facing a very weak, flawed candidate in Roy Moore. The second was it was a special election, so that election was at the top of the ballot. Neither of those factors are going to be uh, in place in 2020 as well. And so Tommy Tuberville may not have elective experience, but he doesn't have the same baggage that Roy Moore has. Additionally, Alabama is one of the few states that still has the option for voters to simply check all Republican candidates or all Democratic candidates on the ballot. This is important to note because President Donald Trump, though uh, has a net negative approval rating, is still very popular within the state of Alabama. And so he's going to garner a lot of support. There's that straight ticket option, and that's going to generate a lot more support for Tommy Tuberville in this election. Congressional seats are decided based on a popular vote. Still, it's easy to look at a map of Alabama and look at the different counties and seeing, okay, this county had a majority 
vote Democrat. This county had a majority vote Republican. For the counties in Alabama, which counties would you say are quote unquote safe for Tommy Tuberville? So most of the, as you pointed out, uh, counties in Alabama are uh, solidly partisan. Um, 65 of the 67 counties have voted the same way in presidential elections from 2008, 12, and 16. Only about 12 of those counties um, were reliably Democratic, that being in the Black Belt, a, a swath of counties extending through the state through central Alabama. Jefferson County is also uh, reliably Democratic. So that leaves essentially the rest of the state to be reliably Republican. However, it's important to note that um, there, there were two of the districts, um, Barber and Conecuh counties, not districts, um, that um, did switch their vote between 2008, 12, and 16. So those two counties could um, be, be competitive. They should be ones that we can keep an eye on. Uh, additionally, Tuscaloosa County actually um, supported uh, Doug Jones in 2017 and then Walt Maddox in 2018. So that's another county that we could potentially keep an eye on um, when it comes to maybe voting differently than we might expect. So we talk about counties that are safe for both candidate, candidates. Uh, what are specific cities or counties in general that candidates need to do well in in order to win the election? So Doug Jones is going to have to need um, pretty high reliable turnout in the major metro areas across the state. I'm thinking about Mobile, I'm thinking about Huntsville, of course, Birmingham and Montgomery. Um, those are the places that he was able to garner uh, kind of above average support for a Democrat uh, when he won in 2017. So he's going to have to see uh, a similarly large shift in 2020 in order to succeed. Uh, but again, the fundamentals are in Tommy Tuberville's favor. So as long as he can kind of stay the path, the, he should be able to uh, win election I'm sorry win election moving now into our largest race the race for the White House uh, President Donald Trump is running for re-election as the Republican candidate his challenger is former Vice President Joe Biden on the Democrat ticket uh, what are some of the key issues that our nation is currently facing that will potentially determine the election this year, despite how unusual it may seem, is pretty similar to most presidential elections in that uh, the economy is also often going to be at the forefront of people's minds. Um, necessarily, health care has become an increasingly important issue uh, and has maintained the case for a, a, over a decade now. Um, Coupled with the pandemic, these three issues are, are intimately related. And so uh, addressing the pandemic, providing adequate and affordable health care, and uh, kind of spurring economic growth and ensuring jobs for everyone, those are probably going to be the, the most dominant factors in voters' minds that could potentially shape the election. What about key issues that are specific towards Alabama? So Alabama has not experienced the uh, same number of jobless claims as uh, some other states around the country. So maybe um, the, the unemployment economic growth may not feature as prominently in the minds of voters, but um, Alabama is still near the top of the list when it comes to COVID infection rates. And so handling the pandemic, um, providing health care, those could feature more prominently. However, it's important to note that our political environment is currently marked by increased nationalization. By that I mean voters are more concerned about which party is in power within the government and less concerned about which candidate can address state-specific needs. So we could see voters deciding um, who to support based more on national conditions than state-level conditions. So as we stated earlier, the two congressional races are being decided by popular vote. However, with the presidency, it's decided by an electoral college. Uh, which states would you say are going to be safely voting Democrat? So the, the West Coast and the Northeast are typically very uh, strong Democratic uh, areas. Um, there, there are a couple of states scattered throughout. I think about Illinois, I think about Minnesota. Um, those states are reliably Democratic. What about the states that are safe for Republicans? So the, the Deep South typically is a, a stronghold for um, the Republican Party. I also think about uh, many areas in the Southwest and much of the Midwest as well as the Mountain West. And so it's kind of a lot of the central part of the country is a lot more um, Republican leaning. So with both candidates having apparent safe states for them and safe electoral votes for them, 
what are going to be the key battleground states that are going to be crucial to either candidate? So th there are a number of states that uh, are garnering a lot of attention this year. Florida is always one of them. Um, Georgia has been slowly leaning Democratic over time, so that's another one that people are looking towards. Um, North Carolina is another Deep South state that could end up um, voting Democratic. Uh, but most of the battleground states are going to be in the Great Lakes area. I think about uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Those same states that propelled Trump to victory in 2016 could be the same ones that do him in uh, in 2020. This election, we're going to be seeing a lot more mail-in ballots than we have previously. Now, when it comes to mail-in ballots, there are some states that are already voting, yet we are five weeks out from the election. Do you think mail-in ballots will play a significant factor in who is elected, but also will they play a significant factor in when the election is called? So. One thing to know about uh, mail-in ballots is most electoral reforms typically just make it easier for the people who are already going to participate to continue to do so. And so I don't expect there to be a huge difference in who wins based on mail-in balloting. To your second question, it very well could determine when we know the outcome because the the increase in the use of mail-in balloting in response to the COVID pandemic has not necessarily been met with the same capacity to count mail-in ballots. Election administrators are professional, hardworking people, but there's only so much that they can do. And so again, this increase in uh, mail-in balloting could slow down the ballot tabulation process. It may be the case that we go to bed on election night um, with one narrative thinking one candidate is ahead and then later in the week that, that shifts as those ballots get counted. That doesn't mean anything nefarious has necessarily happened. Instead, it's just an artifact of the ballot tabulation process. Which demographics currently do you believe Trump is pulling higher in? Uh, President Trump is currently doing best with white voters, especially men. Um, the older a voter is, the more likely they are to support the president as well, with his strongest demographic being those 65 and older. Oh, what about the demographics that Biden is doing better in? Biden is doing particularly well uh, with non-white voters and younger voters, uh, as well as women. Um, it's important to note that the Biden's strengths, uh, his, his advantage within the groups that support him more are greater than the advantages for the groups supporting Trump. Therefore, Biden is polling considerably ahead of the president, um, about seven to eight points. Importantly, as we talked about, uh, in a lot of those battleground states. So we saw in 2016, voter turnout across the nation was low. Do you think with 2020, we will see a similar voter turnout or will it be higher or lower? So the high water mark for a presidential election is about 60% turnout. Um, there is kind of unprecedented enthusiasm for this particular election though. Uh, we saw a little bit of that in 2018 where we saw 50% turnout in a midterm election where typically we might only expect 30 or 40%. Um, so given the, the increase in mail-in balloting and given the enthusiasm um, for people to vote in this election, we could see um, record or at least near record high turnout for a presidential election in 2020. How do you think voter turnout will be in Alabama? So Alabama is typically slightly below average uh, compared to the rest of the country in turnout. Um, but given the, the increased mail-in balloting, given a hotly contested Senate election, and given an extremely consequential presidential election, we could see uh, turnout increase in the state of Alabama as well. Is there anything else about the way Alabama votes that you would like to talk about? Nothing immediately comes to mind. Well, in that case, that is all the time that we have for today. Dr. Williamson, I want to thank you once again for coming down and sitting down on this episode of Plain Talk. Absolutely. Thank you. For all you sitting at home, please make sure to follow us on all of our social medias, social medias at Eagle Eye TV and check out our website at eagleeyeauburn.com. We will have more episodes of Plain Talk in the coming weeks as we prepare for the election in our election show, Eye on the White House. Be sure to tune in to Eagle Eye TV on November 3rd for all your election coverage. I'm AJ Rivera and War Eagle.